All right, folks, I hope you're having a great day today. Welcome. Uh, today I want to take a look at a book that's become probably one of my top 10 favorite books in the last 10 years that I've read or so. It was published in 1973. Um, it's actually heavily influential. Um, it's actually written by a guy who only wrote a, a handful of books, uh, Sterling Lanier. Um, and Sterling Lanier um, was more of a sculptor, an editor. He did a bunch of other things, too. He only published a handful of books, but this book, Hero's Journey, which was his first book he published um, in 73, is incredibly different. It's incredibly evocative. There's just a lot of great stuff going on in it. It's also, I think it's also the most influential book you've never heard of that, that's been published recently. Um, it's been influential on, on tons of things that have happened since in science fiction, in fantasy, everything from games uh, to movies and so forth. So we'll talk here in a little bit about how, how influential it's been take a look at the story, all the different kind of elements that make it really a classic to my mind. Um, I have purchased this book for people um, since I've read it. They've all loved it and, and, and have recommended it to other people. I could not give you a higher recommendation for Hero's Journey um, than what I, th then you should pick it up and buy it, no matter what. Um, it's a novel written in 1973. So, who is Sterling Lanier? Let's talk a little bit about the author. Um, Sterling Lanier was born in the 20s. He was um, somebody who was more passionate about sculpture. He went to an Ivy League school and so forth. He was a sculptor. A lot of his stuff actually made it to high-level places, like the Smithsonian, where you can still see some of his stuff today. Um, he was also a big fan of science fiction, fantasy, and horror stuff. Um, in fact, he actually would bring some of his sculpting to some of these different, uh, his, his fandom. For example, he actually sent him, he was corresponding with Tolkien. He actually made these little tiny miniatures for all the different characters in The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. Uh, he sent them to Tolkien. Tolkien said these were great. He displayed them. He thought they were great. But Tolkien actually asked and said, would you not commercialize them? Would you not sell them? So he said, I, I'll, I'll respect that, even though he probably could have made a lot of money for him. They're very high quality stuff. But Sterling Lanio was also really involved as an editor on the editing side of things, again as a fan um, and as somebody who's kind of classically educated um, at an Ivy League school and a, and a big fan of the arts, um, just generally as a sculptor. Editing was kind of a call for him. So he was an editor. While he was an editor, he found a lot of people, but he's most famous for being the person who sought out and brought in um, Frank Herbert's Dune. Um, Dune had been rejected by more than 20 publishers. It was kind of an outside the the box style of science fiction that people were not, uh, that the editors were not comfortable committing to. Um, Sterling Lanier had read a short story written by Herbert um, and sought him out um, and said, hey, I'm, a, I'm an editor for this kind of small house publisher. Um, I could be interested in taking a look at anything else you have because I thought you have a lot of talent. Um, and he published Dune. Um, and he, he even believed in it so much he had a hardcover copy of Dune made ahead of time because he thought this is going to be this is going to be big. This is a high quality piece. He was right in that it was a high quality piece, but because it was so different, um, Dune took a while to catch on, and it wasn't until two or three years later that the that the Dune book really started to sell and sell well and pick up pick up its pick up its momentum. By that time, he had been let go by his company because their, the sales were of Dune and some of his other works were on, a little on the slow side uh, from picking up steam. Uh, so he was let go from that job, unfortunately. Although they probably would have wanted to hire him back later on, seeing the success that Dune and Herbert had had uh, on their bottom line. Anyway, um, so he's also a writer too, and he comes to to writing, um, and his first book is going to be Hero's Journey. Now, in any sort of a, a, a when you see a novel that's going to be titled basically Hero's Journey, I mean, it's, it's missing one letter from that, it's obviously going to try to play into the sort of this Campbell style of a, a mythic arc, um, the, 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 the traditional journey of the hero from a lower level to a higher level and such, and all, all the typical accomplishments that you're going to have to deal with. So you can already tell up front that that's what he's going to try to do with this novel, and I think he succeeds masterfully. This is such a good read. It is so fun. So let's take a look at it. Let's unpack it first, and then we'll talk about its influence afterwards. Um, this this is this is a novel set in the 70s, and in the 70s, uh, in the early 70s, um, is when it's written. So it has a lot of a kind of a 70s feel to it when you read the story. Um, it's definitely an artifact of its time. Its hero is a mustachioed Native American man set in the post-apocalyptic world, hundreds and hundreds of years in the future, in Canada, 
He is a psychic ranger cleric whose rank is senior kill man for the church, who's out there on the wilderness kind of bringing in sort of dealing with a lot of the monsters and such that are out there. He um, rides a giant mutated moose, and he has best friend is this psychic bear that he communicates with. That is... I mean, I can't say it any better than that. It's just so, so awesome. I mean, <laughs> all the different characteristics that you bring into them, all the different things that are in there. It's, I mean, that right there alone is probably going to sell you. If it's, if I can't tell you that uh, that this thick mustachioed, you know, Native American man in can't, living in a post-apocalyptic Canada riding a giant moose with a psychic bear for his friend, and he's basically a psychic ranger cleric, that 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 should tell you right there. This is going to be a fun book. It's going to be a fun read. Um, and it is. Um, it's, it's, it's set in a post-apocalyptic um, universe after a nuclear fallout had occurred. Um, it has a lot of the sort of mutations that you would expect from a traditional sort of story in this era that didn't take radiation like kind of seriously, like you would just die from it. Instead, so you'd be mutated and stuff like that. Um, so it has that appeal to it. Um, here, fighting against mutated monsters that represent today's day and age. The place names are corrupted versions of place names from today um, and all that sort of stuff. So there's a lot of those sorts of things. And um, the northern Canada, because it wasn't really exposed to a lot of the fallout, is actually in a lot better condition than a lot of the other places. So a lot of the people there survived and a lot of the Native Americans and the tribes and the local people there were, are one of the major centers of civilization in this sort of post-apocalyptic world. Um, during the course of the story, um, he's going to have a number of people he's going to bring on his side in addition to his psychic bear friend. Um, he's going to meet up with um, another person who has some psychic powers, um, as well as um, a woman that he rescues and some other stuff too. He, he's going to be involved with trying to take down this, this nasty evil brotherhood that is existing. He finds out some clues about them, tra tracks them down, and those are going to be ultimately the bad guys he's going to try to take out. So there are a number of things happening over the course of the story. Um, one of the more compelling things is just how avant-garde this story feels like. And when I'm saying that, what I'm saying that from is um, not from, it doesn't read like it was published in 1973, but 1983. Um, and, and the reason why I say that is because it's really kind of an ur-text uh, for anything that's kind of role-playing or Dungeons and Dragons-esque. Um, Gary Gygax cites this book as one of the influences of his Dungeons and Dragons game in, that came out a couple of years afterwards, um, and right about the same time. He cites this and says, this is a major influence. So, and, 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 and so that's one of the reasons why I, I sought it out, to check it out. And it reads like Dungeons and Dragons. For example, this, our main character has these various psychic powers, and after he gets involved in altercations or battles with people, and he learns new skills as a result of those, or his skills become more power, you can basically see him leveling up as the book progresses in a traditional sort of gaming level up context. This is where I think the concept of leveling up came from. It comes from this book. Um, similarly, um, his own, his own psychic powers are very much like the psychic system from Dungeons and Dragons. They're probably lifted from this wholesale. Um, another class, the Druid class, comes from this book. There's, for example, there's another group of folks, one of those who's going to be his ally, um, and they call themselves Eleventists because they support an Eleventh Commandment that they've come up with after this post-apocalyptic event happened. And the post-apocalyptic event was, you know, man really screwing up the world for other men. So their sort of 11th commandment that they now follow is, is that you should not um, disrespect or, disre or uh, the earth, that you should take it seriously, you should be more sustainable and such. Um, and as a result, they have a, a, they're, they're kind of neutral, they kind of support a number of different states and people um, and so forth. Um, they're just making sure that people take care of the world and its natural resources because they didn't before and that's how we got to this mess. And they're very passionate about that. And they have developed a very different set of skills and powers. The one who's going, the Eleventist who's going to join his group, um, has a very different set of psychic powers. Um, he can make the group immune to being seen by animals, or conjuring up an animal, or something, or or, or have like if an animal tries to attack him, um, he can turn it away without having to actually engage it or anything by just kind of controlling it a little bit. So he has a respect for, for earth, for animals, for plants, and so forth. That's very much like the druid class from Dungeons and Dragons, which has its own separate school of magic. It's very passionate about nature. It's much more passionate than nature than it is about the other things. It's, it's, it's kind of a neutral sort of setup. And, and so this, that class feels like it was lifted wholesale from Hero's Journey. Um, 
by uh, Sterling Lanier. So it, there's a lot of huge influences, in, and again, um, he even says this is one of the key influences, and you can see it. It's just in, in so many different things that are happening, from the kind of, he gets more experienced, the psionic system, the, the, the druid kind of sort of uh, an earth first, other people second kind of a concept. Uh, there are a lot of these different sort of um, interesting in intersections that you can kind of see between this book and everything else that came consequence. And so you can see, and because, you know, not just Dungeons and Dragons, right, but all, all, all other subsequent games, all other subsequent video games, uh, um, as well as novels and books, uh, comics, um, all, all those sorts of media that have followed. Um, have definitely taken um, and have had kind of this concept of the Druid, the nature pro, pro people, um, at the leveling up concept of how, how you get more and more experience and skills over time and how that actually plays out in a story rather than just behind the scenes kind of characterization um, and such. And so you can see all these different kind of inter interwoven things that he does that really, really have influenced today. And so in addition to kind of seeing that for the first time in this work, as a kind of a proto work that kind of inspired much of what Dungeons and Dragons and modern modern fantasy and science fiction have become today, it's also important because it's just a great story. Um, again, the concept of, of, of this you know this guy and, and all the different things it's just so bizarre, <laughs> but it's really good. Now this is Sterling Lanier's first publication. And while he was an editor, you know as we all know, the first time you do something yourself, it's not always perfect. So. I have read his other novels. He only wrote a few, uh, Mars Under Marswood. Um, um, he's also got a, a sequel to this book too in the 80s. Um, while the writing, the, the writing in those books is gonna be better than the writing in this book. But this book is the best one of the plot by far. And the reason is it has this energy, this vivaciousness to it that the other ones, that, the, that his other two or three books lack. Um, it has this sort of, uh, it, it has, this, has this real strong sense of itself and what it's doing. Now, there are some things that he does that are a little trope. For example, every single chapter is going to have a fight in it. Whether that fight does or does not apply to the plot is going to have a fight in it, which is probably what you would expect for a first-time writer. <laughs> so there are going to be some of those sorts of things that are going to happen. But the book is incredibly well-written. Incredi the the world-building in this is incredibly well done. And, and all the characters are just so bizarre and so awesome. And it's so easy to fall in love with the world. And I really, really wish that he had written more in the world than just one sequel. Because the world is so well done. Um, and I'd love to see people go back to it. I'd like to go back to it myself. I think his world's awesome. So, anyway, that is Sterling Lanier's um, uh, played down. Sterling Lanier's Hero's Journey for you. It is a great book. I would recommend checking it out heavily if, when you get a chance. So, if you, once again, if you've if you've read it, or or, or if you've never even heard of it, <laughs> tr check it out. You're gonna like it. Trust me. Th I'll talk to you more about the comments below. If you have read it and you're like, hmm. I think you may have mischaracterized it, or what about this passage, or this section, you know, I try to keep my reviews spoiler free, but if there's something in there you want to talk about, let's talk about it, let's unpack it in the comments, I'd be happy to do that for you. If you did watch this video all the way, hey, I really do appreciate that you took some time out of your day to watch it, we all have busy days in the lives, so I appreciate that a lot. If you like this, feel free to subscribe, there's going to be a lot more videos to follow. Once again, thanks for your time.